Here I'm going to talk about sound transduction, and I'm going to focus on the tip links. I'm going to talk about the entire process of sound transduction. This is the entire sound apparatus. Sound travels through the outer ear canal and causes the tympanic membrane, sometimes referred to as the eardrum, to vibrate. That vibrates then these three bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, which in turn vibrates a membrane called the oval window. This is an air-filled cavity. There's a tube that runs back down here toward the pharynx, and this is called the eustachian tube. If the pressure in here rises too much, we can yawn or pop our ear to allow the pressure to leave, or if the pressure in here is too low, we do the same to allow air to come in here. This we do during flight, for example, when they change the pressure in the plane. This oval window then vibrates and pushes the fluid along this region here called the scala vestibuli, and the cochlea, this region right here, is a fluid-filled sac. Down here we have the scala tympani, and we see another membrane called a round window, and this must vibrate. If there were no round window, we would lose our ability to hear, because if we were to push in on the oval window without the round window here, because liquid is incompressible, we would not see movement, and we would not hear. Pushing in on this membrane causes the fluid to push that membrane outward. This is the scala media right in here. We have hair cells, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Down here we have the basilar membrane, the tectorial membrane. This region is called the organ of corti. And this region close here, this is called the base and the apex. At the base, we see high frequencies transduced. As the frequencies decrease, we start seeing them being transduced farther and farther back, the lowest frequencies in the back region here. An individual with very good hearing can hear from 20,000 cycles per second, 20,000 hertz, to about 20 hertz here at the apex. If we cut through the cochlea now, we can see the scala vestibuli. This is the region in which the oval window pushes, and the scala tympani, where the round window is connected, and then the scala media right in here. This is the tectorial membrane, and this membrane pushes down on these hair cells. We'll talk a little bit more later about these hair cells in the organ of corti. Here we have the basilar membrane and the cochlear nerve. This region I'm going to talk a little bit about called the stria vascularis. This we call paralymph here, here, and here. This region we call endolymph. Here we can see the tympanic membrane pushing on the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The stapes pushes against the oval window. That pushes fluid in this direction, which then pushes back on the round window, allowing the basilar membrane to vibrate. It's this vibration that we end up transducing into electrical energy. Here are the tip links and the gate as these hair-like structures projecting from hair cells move toward the longer projection that stretches on these tip links, pulling the gate open as the projections move in the opposite direction that relaxes the tip links and the gates close. When the gates are open, potassium can move into and depolarize the membrane. This is endolymph, this is paralymph. There's high potassium concentration here, low potassium concentration in the paralymph. So potassium moves in, depolarizes the membrane. These are voltage-gated calcium channels. When the membrane depolarizes, these open. Calcium then moves in. Calcium is absolutely necessary for exocytosis. In the absence of calcium, exocytosis does not occur. Calcium then is responsible for the release of neurotransmitter, which then stimulates the afferent neuron which leads to the cochlear nerve. As the potassium is brought in, it then leaves from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration out through these potassium channels. So then we ask the question, how does potassium enter a cell passively? Potassium concentrations are high intracellularly, around 150 milliequivalents per liter. So how do we get passive movement of potassium into the cell? Well, that's done by the stria vascularis, and I'm going to use a simple one-cell model to see if we can explain what's going on. In the paralymph, we have 5 millimolar potassium and 150 millimolar sodium. In the endolymph, we have 160 millimolar potassium and only 1 millimolar sodium. 
So in this model, we've got sodium potassium 2 chloride cotransporter pulling potassium in. The sodium potassium ATPase pump also moving potassium in. Chloride is free to move back and forth in this direction. But potassium moves then out in this direction. Sodium does not move out. Only potassium chloride can also move freely in this direction. Unfortunately, a single cell model cannot explain this massive amplification of potassium in the endolymph. We need a multi-cell model, and this here we can see the paralymph here. There's a spiral ligament, and there we can see fibrocytes. The next layer are basal cells and then intermediate cells. And then on this side, we see marginal cells. We're moving potassium constantly through these cells. There are lots of gap junctions between these cells, allowing potassium to move to the basal cell and back down here. We have the sodium potassium pumps, potassium channels. So potassium's moving into this intrastrial space and then moving in this direction. Some of this potassium can come back in and then move back out again. So we have a constant cycling of potassium. But the movement is in this direction. Potassium is not allowed to move back in this direction. So we're constantly moving potassium in this direction until we get a very low potassium here because potassium is either moving into the intermediate cell or into the marginal cells where it's allowed to move in this direction. To simplify this, I'm going to take these three cell layers and combine them into a single layer. We're looking at the fibrocytes, basal, and intermediate cells here. Here we see the sodium potassium to chloride co-transporter, sodium potassium pumps moving potassium in this direction. Chloride is free to move back and forth. Potassium moves out in this direction. It can be pumped back in in this direction, move back out. We have a cycle of potassium moving in this direction. Potassium is also being taken up through this sodium potassium 2 chloride and this potassium pump. Potassium leaves this direction. Sodium does not. So we see potassium and chloride moving in this direction. Chloride can move in this direction as well. So that leaves us with only 2 millimolar potassium in the intrastrial space. That also facilitates movement of potassium out of the capillaries into the strial space so we can continue processing potassium in this direction. Now we can see 160 millimolars of potassium here, 130 millimolars of chloride, 1 millimolar of sodium, and an 80 millivolt positive charge here compared with the paralymph. So what's happening then is potassium is constantly being built up in this side through this stria vascularis. That potassium can leave down its concentration gradient through the paralymph and back here. It can leave in this direction, or it can actually pass from cell to cell and move out in this direction. In this direction, however, the potassium is coming in through the hair cells. And it's through these hair cells that we get the depolarization of this membrane and the eventual signal produced by exocytosis triggering the cochlea nerves. And the signal then passes back to the central nervous system. I'm going to show this again because I'm going to talk a little bit about frequency transduction. We're going to be looking at this region and back in this region. If we straighten out the cochlea, we can see that at the base, we have the basilar membrane is stiffer. There's a large stiffness up here. In the apex, the basilar membrane is less stiff. This means that the resonant frequency of the basilar membrane is going to be higher than the resonant frequency of at the apex. In addition, the outer hair cells are shorter at the base than at the apex. And there is a force, which I'll discuss in a minute, a force produced by the outer hair cells is greater here than here. Now let's look at the actual hair cell lengths and the frequencies. The lowest frequencies, this is around 20 hertz. We see the longest hair cells as we move up to 20,000 hertz. Here we see the shortest hair cells. And I've included cats, which actually have the ability to hear at 40 kilohertz, and bats, which can hear up to 160 kilohertz. Humans with good hearing really are about 20 kilohertz to about 20 hertz. Because of tissue characteristics, however, high frequencies are damp. The tissues cannot vibrate at the frequencies we want. In fact, if you actually just look at dead tissue and try to get them to move, we should not be able to hear above about 1,000 hertz. Yet, very young people with good hearing can perceive sounds at 20 kilohertz. So just how is this possible? There are actually motors inside the hair cell membranes, embedded in the hair cell membranes. The protein is called prestin. 
and this protein binds a chloride ion. Here we're looking at the extracellular space, positively charged, intracellular space, negatively charged. So this membrane is hyperpolarized, we have chloride bound here, and when the membrane depolarizes, it shortens. There are several models. One suggests the chloride moves up, as we see here, binds, then moves up, shortening the Preston molecule. Another model suggests that the chloride does not actually move inward, but rather it stays here, and the charge, however, is transferred from the interior to the exterior of the membrane. Yet other models suggest the chloride is even exchanged for bicarbonate. If we look at one hair cell and just pull out a piece of the membrane, over here we're seeing in the depolarized state the membrane has been compressed. In the hyperpolarized state, the membrane has been expanded. So that allows the hair cell, the entire hair cell, to contract and expand depending on the polarity of the membrane. In the hyperpolarized state, these are the hair cells here attached to supporting cells in the basilar membrane. Once the hair cells are bent and the membrane depolarizes, the cells shorten, pulling up on the basilar membrane. This allows the basilar membrane to vibrate at a much higher amplitude than would occur without the cell shortening. This little animation I've drawn up here shows what's happening. The cells are shortening, pulling up on the basilar membrane. This rocks the basilar membrane, which amplifies the sound in the inner hair cells. The primary function of the outer hair cells is this amplification process, whereas the primary function for the inner hair cells is sound transduction. In the absence of this amplification, if we're just looking at passive movement, here we're seeing the wave moving up. This is a 10 kilohertz pure sinusoidal wave, and it begins to degrade as it continues moving. And in the absence of this amplification process, it would continue down this dotted line and disappear. However, because of the Preston molecules, we see now a sharp spike with about a 50 dB amplification. It's also moved about a half octave. In these shorter air cells at the base, we have a much larger density of these Preston electromotors, and therefore the force generated is greater here than it is here in the apex. All of these features, that is the stiffness of the basilar membrane having a higher resonant frequency, the shorter yet larger electromotor density creating a greater force allows for greater amplification at the base than at the apex is what allows us to hear these higher frequencies.